Shut up, compressor. Hey everyone, Matt here with Duke's Models, and welcome to part 3 of the Tamiya F4B Phantom Build. Now, if you've been following along, parts 1 and 2 were mostly about stalling for time, waiting for Quintus' cockpit set to drop. Well, the time has come, and this third installment is going to be all about the cockpit. Now, this video is going to be a bit different from my usual build videos. Because I was jumping around a lot and shooting a lot of footage, anything I'd edit down from the 70 clips I recorded would be choppy and really fucking long. So instead, I'm going to do the script and voiceover thing to hopefully bring everything into some kind of order. Okay, where were we? Ah, uh, yes. First, we have to prep the cockpit for the Quinta set. Conceptually, Quinta 3D decals serve the same function as color photo etch, and the preparation process is pretty much the same. Namely, removing the detail from the side consoles, instrument panel, and so on. Next, I need to match the cockpit color to the gray of the Quinta decals. The interior color should be dark gold gray, but the Quinta gray is much lighter than that, so I'm going to have to hunt. Eyeballing the decals on their backing paper, I think a mix of Tamiya XF19 sky gray, XF80 medium sea gray, and LP37 light ghost gray should do the trick. And it doesn't. The backing sheet is clearly tricking the eye like one of those optical illusions that flashes around the internet sometimes. You know, the ones where you have two grays that are the exact same, but because of what's around them, they look light and dark. That kind of thing. In place, it's clearly much lighter. So I hunt around and find that MRP 242 Sky Gray matches quite nicely. And you know what that means. Respray! Next, it's time to apply these Quinta decals. While you do have to soak them in water to separate them from their backing sheet, the adhesive isn't really sufficient to hold them all that well, so the actual application process is again very similar to color PE. Place a bit of glue, place the decal, and so on. You get the idea. And here's the set fully installed. Now, I know some people consider these cheating, and I really don't care. I'm a big believer in conserving your fucks for where they're needed the most. And on something like a 148 scale F4, the cockpit is relatively obscured by high sidewalls and a large sill plate. The Quinta set gets me 80% of the way to what I'd do with the super detail job with maybe 10% of the effort. And that saves my fucks to apply elsewhere. Would I use them on everything? Nah. But on a case-by-case -case basis, absolutely I would. Next, after a bit of light detail painting, I hit the cockpit with some ammo medium gray acrylic filter. I got turned on to this stuff with Tank the Rainbow, and I really like it. It's kind of like a lazy magic wash, except it doesn't just bury itself into the corners and cracks and whatnot. It also provides a nice little patina across the whole surface. Now, one thing I've been planning all along with this build is something I haven't done with a 148th kit since I was a kid, using the kit's crew figures. That's right, I'm going to load this Phantom up with a pilot and Rio. Why? Well, one part is that I want to. I mean, one of my 2021 goals has been to improve my figure game beyond non-existent, and I haven't been doing a bang-up job of it. And these little dudes have helmets and visors and oxygen masks, so I won't get tripped up on the faces the way that I usually do. And the second part is that my AOA decal sheet includes some nifty little VMFA 323 helmet decals, and this gives me a chance to use them. Anyway, seeing the crew in the ejection seats and the big old sill plate installed really rams home just how not visible the cockpit details are going to be once all is said and done. 
so it's really not worth going to town on super detailing or weathering. To finish off the cockpit and kill off some of the shine from the Quinta decals, I spray a coat of MRP Semi-Matte Clear, and then glue the cockpit bits into place. I'm leaving the control stick loose for now, since it needs to be angled into the pilot's hand. With the cockpit sorted out, it's onto the crew and the seats. I keep just wanting to call them the pilots instead of the pilot and the Rio, or maybe it's weapon systems officer, I, I don't know. So if I slip up here and there, just think of it as shorthand, pilots. Now, these dudes need to be primed, and I want to preserve as much detail as I can, since what's there can be kind of vague. So I'm using some MRP Black Fine Surface Primer. Now, why am I doing these guys right now? Why not add them later in the build? Because the pilot especially needs to be installed before the cockpit sill plate, otherwise it's pretty much impossible to get them in. So this isn't something where I can add them later if I decide to. I need to make that play now. And by tackling them here, this way if I fuck it up, I can just call an audible and drop in some quick boost Martin Bakers or something like that. For painting the figures, I decide to start with their most visible element, the helmets. These I paint with MRP Basic White and with a red-brown mix that kinda comes close to matching the brown that VMFA 323 uses. And I discover that, by spraying at certain angles, I can avoid hitting the visor, which is pretty cool. Hopping on down to the figure bodies, I use MRP Dunkelgelb for a modified version of black and white shading. And around this time, I also realized that there's a good chance these pilots would have been wearing Tiger Stripe camo a kind of stripey camouflage locally sourced in Vietnam. It shows up in some 323 archival footage, and you may recognize it as the camo worn by Virgil Cole in Flight of the Intruder. Look, just relax. Next, it's onto the seat. The lower seat cushion gets painted MRP-12 light khaki, and the main portion of the headrest, MRP-101 SEA dark green. For the main seat back, I use some Tamiya XF-49 khaki, and I mask off the separation line with the headrest to avoid any overspray. The top of the headrest gets MRP Gunship Green, since it's often seen as a bluer green than the other seat elements. Back to the pilots, I follow Tamiya's paint mix for their shirts, three parts XF61 dark green and one part XF2 flat white. The overalls get sprayed with four parts XF25 light sea gray and one part XF61 dark green. Next, it's on to attempting the tiger stripe camo. This will be a task. My tiny freehand painting skills are probably best described as clumsy, and I'm certainly no Fanch Lubin out there painting bottles of Coppertone sunscreen in 135th scale. But the tiger stripe would add a cool visual element and probably help mask some of the vague detail in these kit figures. I start out with some kind of brown mix, since there are really four colors involved in Tiger Stripe. The usual khaki, green, drab color, a splotchy brownish color, and then stripey goodness coming from a lighter, sandy type color, and black. Next, it's onto the sandy color, and I'm using Warfront Grau for this. I think Warfront may be a sub-brand of Scale 75, or maybe a sub-brand of Vallejo, whatever. It's hard to keep all these brands straight when they use the exact same fucking bottles. It's an acrylic, and it acts just like Vallejo model color, so whatever. Painting tiny stripes on tiny figures is a hell of an exercise. There's a lot of held breath, and a lot of expletives that would give certain finger-wagging YouTube commenters conniptions. For the black, I switch over to Liquitex Acrylic Ink. I love this stuff because it's thin, but covers brilliantly, and also, when you use it straight, it has a wonderful tendency to stay exactly where you put it. I love it so much that I also used it to paint the visors of the helmets. Okay, with the Tiger Stripe camo down about as well as I can manage, it's time to shift focus back to the helmets, and namely the AOA helmet decals. I haven't had a chance to look at them right next to the helmets before, and they seem pretty massive. Application is exactly how you'd expect decals to go, 
water, some Mr. Mark setter to help it slide around, and some ammo decal solvent to melt the fuckers into place. The big stripey decal does end up being too large, but I leave it dangling off the back like a bad mullet and just trim the excess away once it's all dried. After the helmet decals are set, I want to seal them in and also give the helmet shells and visors a good gloss coat. Since I used Liquitex ink on the visor, I'm worried about using anything too hot. I mean, I've had lacquers cause that stuff to kind of melt and run and do various weird things before, so better safe than sorry. Instead, I use all clad aqua gloss. And this stuff is a great utility gloss, but it doesn't quite get me to the sheen level that I want. So I'll have to revisit that later. Back to the figures, I'm still perturbed by that muddy detail on their chests. Washes will help, sure, but I think I also need to pay attention to the highlights as well as the shadows. So I bust out some ammo dry brushing paints. Yeah, yeah, I've made fun of these in the past, and they're still silly, but with the discontinuation of Model Master enamels, I have to admit I haven't really found a great replacement for the rare times that I need to dry brush something. And these absolutely do the trick, giving that little extra oomph to the highlights and the chest detail and fabric creases. After dry brushing, I shift gears to the shadows and mix up a magic wash using aqua gloss, water, some Derivan Matisse surface tension breaker, and Tamiya XF61 dark green, considering it was a base color for both of the green-gray color mixes. This is intended to settle into the recesses and provide some boost to the shadows. When the magic wash dries, it's time to seal up and ungloss the figures with some VMS matte varnish. This stuff has quickly become my preferred acrylic ungloss, and I'm sticking with acrylic here because, again, that Liquitex ink can be a bit fragile and temperamental around lacquers. And it's around this point that I realize I need to redo the seats. First, because I left some straps on the sides of the headrest and those need to come off for the Quinta ones to go on. And because I want to add some additional texture to the top of the headrest. Yeah, the main body is pretty smooth, like a vinyl booth at a diner, but the top is all creased and wrinkly and some different material altogether. I won't pretend to even have the faintest idea of what it is, but I'm guessing it probably has something to do with a parachute pack or something like that. To get somewhere in the ballpark of the texture, I grab some tissue paper, wad it all up, and straighten it out again, then glue it to the top of the headrest. Working my way first around, and then kind of mashing it down on top. Now, I may not remember to get to it later, but it's important here to watch the bulkiness of this since it can interfere with installing this part to the seat frame. I actually had to cut a bit away, but because it's hidden by the frame, it doesn't really matter. Once the tissue's ready to go, it's time to reprime it, then repaint the whole headrest cushion thing. But you've seen this before, so let's go ahead and jump ahead. One thing I've noticed in several reference photos that I don't think I've ever seen done in a scale F4 is this green anodized band that runs around the headrest. I'm assuming it's some kind of seal or mount or whatnot for the wrinkly bit at the top. Again, not an expert on injection seat design. I just know I want to recreate it, or at least its impression. To do that, I take a strip of Tom Annie's new aluminum line decals, and I hit it with some MRP clear green. Then, crossing my fingers, I just apply the decal. And holy shit, it actually works. Cool. Now moving on to the injection pull handles, I considered for a hot minute replacing them with the quinta poles, but nah, let's paint them instead. First, I spray them yellow. Then I carefully wrap them in 0.7mm azu tape, using a lot of expletives along the way. You know how annoying it is wrapping a ribbon or some shit around a patio railing or a stair banister? This is like that, but fucking tiny. Anyway, once I get it wrapped, I spray a mix of MRP, AMT12, and tire rubber. Not quite black, because if you look at all the photos of these things, they're always a bit grubby looking. They're never just pure yellow and pure black. Next, I paint the base of the pull handle red and pick out various metallic details with ammo steel. Then I apply some of the new Annie's aluminum stencils to the side of the headrest. And do the green anodized thing on a bunch of the metal details with AK Real Colors Clear Green. I later switched to Tamiya Clear Green since it wasn't so olivey, 
but I didn't get that on camera, so you'll just kind of have to go with it. If you thought the Quinta ship was only for the cockpit consoles, you thought wrong. There are still a fuckload of harnesses and straps visible above the crew's shoulders, so it's time to get those in place, starting with the two straps on each side of the headrest. Next, I suppose it happened off camera somewhere along the way, but I added Quinta harnesses to the two figures, since the molded on stuff was just vague as shit. But this isn't a World War II aircraft where you can slap harnesses on a figure and call it good. On these Martin Baker seats, there are straps hanging down from the headrest that still hang down just the same way when the seat's occupied. So, I basically need to drape additional harnesses behind the figures, but not have them interfere with the figure backs fitting the seat cushions. These are applied the same way as all of Quinta's stuff, and then I just basically trim them off at the bottom once I make sure everything lines up. With the figures and seats increasingly sorted, it's time to bounce back to the helmets. Earlier, I aquaglossed them, and I wasn't happy about the level of sheen I was getting. So on a whim, I decided to try some VMS gloss varnish, and I don't know why, but I wondered, can I brush it on? So I put the VMS and aquagloss to a little contest on a TIE pilot I'd printed out earlier in the year. The aquagloss gave a bit of a semi-gloss sheen, but the VMS stuff, especially over two coats, built up a pretty respectable gloss. Good enough for me, at least. Adding a tiny bit of their airbrush thinner for its leveling properties, I brush glossed the helmets and visors with the VMS gloss varnish. After it dried, I moved on to the not-gloss elements of the helmets, including the liner that runs along the bottom. This I carefully brushed in a mix of Vallejo black and black gray, slightly thinned. Next, I mixed up some Vallejo camo olive green and some camo olive green mixed with khaki gray to deal with the oxygen mask and straps. And to be honest, this is where we really start to see the detail limits of these Tamiya kit figures. I mean, it's fine, but it's not great. Careful brushing, or as careful as I can be, ensues. But with the vague detail, it's a bit like coloring in a coloring book that's lacking nice black lines. Once the masks and straps are painted, it's time to finally install the heads using a bit of ammo ultra glue. Now that Facebook commenters can no longer make lame jokes about headless pilots, it's time to apply some Starship wash to pop out some of those details. I intentionally go a little bit overboard here to give the helmets, well, the white helmet, some extra contrast. The brown helmet just kind of shrugs it all off. Sorry, backseat dude. Next, I figure if the VMS gloss varnish can be brushed, maybe the matte varnish can be brushed too. And, dear viewer, it can which is useful not only here, but in a potential ton of other applications where the ability to gloss and ungloss very small detailed parts can really come in handy. Okay, back to the damn seats. So on the left strap, there's some kind of green cable. It runs from the middle of the strap and kind of disappears up into the wrinkly bit on the top of the headrest. No, I have no idea what it does. Let's just say it's the Mountain Dew tube. Anyway, I wanted to recreate it, so I pulled out some lead wire, painted it green, and glued it in place. Next, it's time for some light oil play. I use some oil brusher medium gray and a bit of dark mud to grunge up the eject loops. Then I pop over to enamel land and bring in some gun sandy wash for the seat frame. This stuff seems like a crazy choice at first, I mean, way too overpowering for a black seat frame, right? Well. Yeah, it totally is, until I come back over it with some Guns Multi-Black. The combination of the two lend the frame a somewhat worn appearance without being too much. And finally, 
it's onto some oil brushes for the seat cushion, which is probably overkill since there'll be figures there, but just in case parts of it are visible. After the oil brushes dry, I come back with some VMS matte varnish to flatten things out, and then the cockpit work, or at least this stage of it, is done. And after all that, here we are with the finished seats in the finished cockpit. Everything's looking good, so let's go ahead and add the figures. And there you have it, the finished cockpit. Now keep in mind, a lot of the side detail is going to be all but completely hidden by the one-two of the figures and the rather large sill plate that'll come down and sit on top of everything. But we'll deal with that in a future episode. So that just about wraps it up for what turned into one hell of a rabbit hole with the cockpit. In part four, I'll be moving on to getting the fuselage closed and the wings installed. And if you want to get early access to that and all my other videos, as well as some fun behind the scenes looks at ongoing builds and plans for future stuff, I'd love it if you'd become a Patreon supporter over at patreon.com slash dugsmodels. And if not, no worries. Thanks for checking out part three of the F4 Phantom build. Keep an eye out for part four coming in the near future, and I'll catch y'all later.